Hello, everyone. Uh, today's lecture is on World War II and the Labor Liberal Coalition. Um, if you'll remember our lecture from last week, which was about uh, the Great Depression and the rise of the Industrial Unions Movement, kind of its codification in the, into law through the National Labor Relations Act, we sort of ended around 1941, and it was a good stopping point for a couple of reasons. The first is that it was, uh, 1941 kind of brought the completion of a series of organization campaigns, major organization campaigns within the labor movement. Uh, in 1941, you have the Steelworkers Organizing Committee and the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steelworkers successfully um, unionizing United States Steel, USS, that giant steel company that had kind of morphed out of these earlier mergers between Carnegie Steel and some of these other regional steel producers. But they also successfully unionized uh, smaller steel uh, foundries and mills um, like, lit or, uh, like Republic Steel in a campaign that was known as the Little Steel Strikes. So you have the steel industry becoming organized. You also have the success of the United Auto Workers in organizing uh, the major three auto manufacturing companies, but also uh, smaller operations, part suppliers, independent auto manufacturers. In 1941, uh, Ford, the last of the big three auto manufacturers to kind of hold out against the UAW, finally negotiates their first contract with them. Um, kind of bringing to a close that earlier wave of sit-down uh, union organizing that was kicked off in 1936 with the, the sit-down strike in Flint against General Motors. In 1941, uh, as you may already know, uh, December 7th specifically, America is dragged into uh, the developing conflict of World War II when the Empire of Japan bombs uh, U.S. military installations in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor. So there's a huge kind of shift in the day-to-day -day lives uh, of a lot of American workers beginning in or yeah, beginning at the end of 1941. But there's also a wider global shift in terms of uh, economic output, trade. Obviously, if half of the war, if one half of the world is at war with another half, uh, that kind of limits uh, the flow of goods and services, and that impacts the trajectory of not only the uh, America's standing in the world, America comes out of World War II as one of the two preeminent superpowers, the other being the Soviet Union. Um, so it definitely alters the trajectory of America's place in the world, but also its economy and uh, by extent of that, the lives of American workers. So per the usual, I'm going to offer a couple of reading recommendations. The first is a little, uh, it's a little bit older. It's about 17 years old now. Um, Nelson Lichtenstein has a book called Labor's War at Home, the CIO in World War II. CIO, if you recall, is this uh, alternative labor federation to the American Federation of Labor that really emphasizes industrial union organizing, uh, organizing an entire industry instead of differentiating workers along class lines and lines of craft, things that kind of uh, broke up the working class into this uh, notion of the labor aristocracy that we had discussed earlier this semester. The CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, wants to do away with all that and focus more on solidarity across an entire industry uh, as part of a wider effort to hearken this concept of industrial democracy, right? The idea that workers, uh, capitalists, and government all have a say in how the economy is run. So how the CIO interacts in World War II, if this lecture is at all uh, interesting to you, that is where I would recommend uh, your next point of reading. The second is, uh, is Daniel J. Clark's Disruption in Detroit, Auto Workers and the Elusive Post-War Boom. This one's a little bit more focused to our immediate kind of surrounding context, uh, where obviously the majority of us, at least anyways, are living in and around Detroit. Um, if you're attending class over the internet and you are not in uh, Michigan or Northern Ohio, good on you. It's starting to get cold here. Um, but Wayne State, of course, is a university in Detroit. And so this history is a little more focused on, on this geographic region. 
Specifically, Daniel Clark looks at these notions of the post-war economic order in the United States as being one of like bountiful plenty. Uh, there's a lot of times when we talk about American history in 1945, 1946, kind of the close of World War II, we have these stereotypes of a very affluent and kind of wined and dined union worker. It's the image that um, anti-union campaigns will really drive home, right? This idea that, oh, things were going great in the, in the country, the economy was doing spectacularly, and then these pesky unions came along and they asked for too much and look at what ended up happening. And what Daniel J. Clark actually finds is that the economy in Detroit after the war was anything but affluent. Um, that's the elusive post-war boom, right? Auto workers uh, routinely were underemployed. They had very few shifts, especially as factories were retooling for peacetime war production. And so stable employment was rare. And union efforts to make sure that auto workers had some sort of income security uh, they approached this through a number of different ways. They had a number of uh, kind of reinforcing, but at the same time competing plans that would have uh, that would have helped auto workers at this time. All of these pushes, like uh, calls for a national health care system that you know still to this day haven't really been been met, they came out of this this lack of an actual economic post-war boom for workers. And so if you're interested in that story or, uh, or Detroit's economy in general terms after World War II, that's definitely a book that you, should, that you should take a look at. It's actually pretty recent scholarship. I had the opportunity to read it earlier this year, um, and I think it's less than a couple years old. It came out toward the end of 2018, if I recall correctly. But right, uh, later on in the lecture, I'll have a third recommendation for you. But for now, we're going to get into uh, the heart of the matter. So throughout the 1930s, uh, during this previous lecture that we had, where we were talking about the American labor movement, the rise of the Congress of Industrial Organization, and uh, these legal battles over the scope of government, uh, the Supreme Court overturns uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act, FDR's New Deal administration has to replace it with the National Labor Relations Act in 1935, and kind of the, the unionization campaigns and the labor history that comes out of that. While all of this is going on, tensions in Europe and East Asia specifically are continuing to rise. Um, after World War I, there are a number of uh, counterintuitive peace terms that are kind of imposed on central power on the central power of Germany. They're kind of required to pay a lot of war reparations that many people in Germany feel are perhaps a little unfair. Um, this is part of a wider historical trend of uh, to the victor go the spoils or the winners right history, so to speak. After World War I, Germany is kind of singled out as the lone aggressor uh, that started the First World War. Whether or not that's true, historians will still debate about that. But blame couldn't really be assigned to Austria-Hungary or the Ottoman Empire because those empires stopped existing just as the Russian Empire had. And so if there's any going to be any country that's going to continue to you know, pay off war debts and kind of take uh, ownership or responsibility for World War I as a conflict, um, the Allies are going to assign that to the last central power, which is Germany. This doesn't help Germany's economy, and if anything from 2020 has taught us, it's that a poorly performing economy is not a very good recipe for domestic economic bliss. As Germany's economy continues to flounder um, at the start, at the end of the 1920s, and then into the start of the 1930s, more radical politicians uh, start to gain appeal um, to voters in in the Weimar Republic, right? Germany had overthrown its, its monarch. It's now a nominal uh, democracy known as the Weimar Republic. And it's becoming increasingly polarized. The ability of the government, uh, while at the same time meeting these post-war demands by the allies, you know, kind of paying back, you know, sorry, we destroyed Belgium. Here's, uh, here's our, our monthly installment plan to repay for that. Well, this government is, is taking on these obligations. It's also not really adequately meeting the, the needs of German people. Germany's dealing with a lot of inflation. It's actually dealing with hyperinflation. You need 30 million uh, Deutschmarks or dollars, I guess, if, if we were to think of them today. You need 30 million dollars if you're going to go buy a carton of eggs. It's very hard to, uh, 
you can't really rely on the currency. The economy is doing very poorly. Unemployment is high. There's a lot of food insecurity. And so Germans uh, are increasingly being divided one of two ways. They're either going to the far right or the far left. And when any country is so intrinsically polarized on itself, uh, you know, a house divided cannot stand. And in 1933, the radical right-wing Nazi party ends up getting a plurality of elections, and their control of, over the government is more or less secured by the middle of the 1930s. And this is how Hitler himself actually is able to rise uh, through democratic means in, into power. Is, uh, the previous government isn't really able to, make, to meet their, uh, their obligations to the citizens, and um, when you have someone who can uh, very slickly just lie their way through things and assign blame to other groups of people for a country's failings, that popularity um, can eventually get, get one ahead in the polls. If any of this sounds familiar, I'm sure it is all coincidence. So in the 1930s, uh, a radical right-wing government takes control of Germany. They start to expand their borders in a mission of conquest. They annex Austria, parts of Czechoslovakia, and then in 1939, they invade Poland. Meanwhile, over in East Asia, uh, the Japanese empire is increasingly uh, becoming internationally isolated. It is expanding its own influence throughout the Pacific as kind of an anti-European crusade. This isn't to say that they're trying to decolonize East Asia, but simply replace European colonists with Japanese colonists. Um, Germany, Italy, and Japan, of course, all make up the Axis powers that are eventually going to wage war on the Allies. Uh, prior to 1941, this does not include the United States. It's more specifically uh, in two separate wars targeting uh, England, France, and Poland, and over in East Asia, it's more or less between Japan and China. Now, even though the United States is officially neutral in the conflict, the U.S. is preferring trade with the anti-fascist allies. Uh, the U.S. is actually more or less banking on the success of the allies because the allies, the allied nations, uh, for better or worse, share a lot of values with the United States that the Axis does not. Um, or at least they share values that the United States finds favorable uh, and attributes that the United States might share with the Axis, uh, it finds unfavorable. So the U.S. is preferring trade with the anti-fascist allies. It has a, it definitely has a kind of invested interest in seeing the allies win. But throughout the 1940s, as the Axis starts to mean, make further and further gains against these allied powers, uh, leaders in the U.S. government, people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and these other New Deal Democrat, Democrats look at the international situation and they realize that they're going to have to take a more proactive approach uh, toward confronting the Allies. A lot of politicians in the U.S. are starting to see war with Germany and Japan and the other Axis states as an inevitability, but the majority of the public doesn't actually want this yet. So one of the ways that you can help an ally in a war without joining the war yourself, uh, prior to the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, I think some 90% of Americans wanted America to remain neutral in the war. If you can't sell a war to your, uh, to your public, the next best thing is to at least produce a lot of uh, armaments and supplies for the allies who are doing the actual fighting. Now, there are plans within the U.S. government to start building uh, defense plants from scratch so that the U.S. could start mass producing armaments like tanks or airplanes or jeeps, trucks, all of these sorts of mechanized equipment that Germany has been able to use very effectively in Europe. Um, and Japan also has been able to use effectively in East Asia to mass produce these sorts of, of tools for the allies to use against the Axis. The problem, though, is that in order to build all of the roads, the, the power lines, the plumbing works, the actual infrastructure, like the factory buildings uh, that are needed to start this mass productive process, a lot of estimates don't have the U.S. turning out any kind of plane or truck or tank until well into, the in well into 1942. Now, 1942 is kind of late, right? Uh, a lot of people don't believe that the Allies will actually be able to hold on that long. Uh, 
by the summer of 1940, for example, Germany has completely overrun both Poland and France. And in June of 1941, they start to invade the Soviet Union uh, and they take a lot of land uh, in those first six months of the conflict. And it entirely looks like by the end of 1941 that the Axis might actually win World War II. So the clock is running out and there's a lot of confusion as to how the US can better support the Allies without waiting the next two years while all of these factories are built. This actually leads labor leaders to approach the government and offer their own plan uh, for supporting the Allied war effort. Uh, Walter Ruther of the UAW famously comes up with his 500 planes a day plan, where the US government in conjunction with labor unions and uh, major manufacturing companies would take shared uh, responsibility for production in the country's existing auto manufacturing plants and basically retool those plants that already existed to produce uh, munitions and other wartime supplies that were needed in Europe and East Asia. Right, we already have the factory, we already have the, the electricity, we already have the plumbing lines, we already have the roads, we just need to put in new machines in these buildings and instead of making a 1942 Buick, make a 1942 I don't know what kind of model they tank they had at that point, Sherman tank, I suppose. Not the Abrams, that's recent. This plan would allow for the government to turn out planes and other arms a lot sooner than 1942. And it was hoped would only minimally damage the country's economic recovery. You have to keep in mind that the Great Depression is still uh, very much a lived reality at this point. By 1940, while well, the economic situation in the United States is faring much better than it was in 1930 or 1931, 32, unemployment is still fairly high, and in some places it's still in the double digits. So by 1941, it's less of the Great Depression and more like the Great Recession, but if you remember the Great Recession, it wasn't exactly uh, the greatest time to be um, a worker really anywhere. Now this plan was opposed by business at first, right? Um, if you are the head of General Motors, even if you believe that the government should be uh, producing tanks for the Allies earlier than the end of 1942, your factory is still your factory and you as your factory, as the owner of that factory should have exclusive rights to how it's used. Well, the Supreme Court actually very well might have agreed with this position, uh, but there was an existing precedent in World War I to, uh, for the government to kind of have a greater say in economic production and economic activity in times of uh, national emergency and war. But also the public opinion might convince you to willingly change your stance on this, right? It doesn't look good uh, publicly if General Motors says you can't use any of our uh, plants and will die defending our right to ex exclusive uh, management of these places. If your competitors Ford and Chrysler take this great patriotic sacrifice and let the government use their institutions, right? How do you think your business is going to fare after the war ends if you're the only manufacturer that didn't do their, their part, so to speak? So eventually auto industry manufacturers and other uh, company giants a seed to this plan, and there's more, and there's kind of a tripart alliance in the governing of war production. Now, the system isn't easily implemented, right? Uh, if you think that the biggest obstacle to wartime production was companies kind of holding out against government interference, then, well, you're wrong. Uh, the CIO and federal government wanted to make sure that these union jobs and these newly retooled defense plants didn't discriminate on the basis of race or sex, which had been kind of the existing orthodoxic practice and really in the economy period up until this point. Now you have companies uh, prior to World War II like Ford um, actively recruiting African-American workers to work in uh, the, uh, to work in the auto industry. However, this wasn't necessarily a policy out of racial benevolence. Uh, Ford actively employed African-American workers to use them to break uh, strikes that were 
supported more or less by the predominantly white United Auto Workers. Now there were uh, black workers in the UAW and there were white strike breakers, of course. There's not a strict dichotomy or uh, identitarian exclusion between those two groups. But by and large, a lot of times, uh, African-American workers facing uh, systemic racism and injustices would be forced to take the most low paying and least uh, satisfactory jobs in order to provide for their families, even if those jobs were technically in violation of the strike. Inclusion of black workers into previously all white shops prompts the emergence of what's known as hate strikes. Hate strikes are wildcat strikes that are launched in an effort to oppose racial integration at work or the integration of women uh, to a previously all male masculine uh, sphere of work. You'll start to run into this as we get more into Myers Manhood on the line book, hint, hint. But these hate strikes contributed to a lot of tensions that increased in Detroit. And in 1943, either directly or uh, only slightly indirectly contributed to the 1943 Detroit riots, where white Detroiters attacked and burned and uh, did a lot of damage to uh, black homes and businesses in the city and also murdered a lot of African American people themselves. So one aspect of the implementation of this program that affords black workers and women workers the same rights to become uh, unionized workers at um, in theory, every level of production of defensive ordinance, getting this policy enacted gets considerable pushback. Um, if you know the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti area, there was a, there is still a famous uh, manufacturing plant out there. During World War II, it was called the Willow Run Bomber Plant, and it's on kind of the uh, the east side of Ypsilanti. If on the other on the west side of Ypsilanti is Ann Arbor. On the east side of Ypsilanti, you have this Willow Run bomber plant. And back when this uh, plant was being retooled, there were plans to actually build a third city out there um, that would be called Victory City or Victory Town. Plans for that act, uh, eventually fall through because uh, local governments cannot reach an agreement with the UAW, the CIO, and the federal government to, make, uh, to allow for integrated housing in this new hypothetical third city. Um, so that's just one example of how uh, persistent racism and systemic racism in society have kind of prevented progress, not only in terms of, of labor organizing and of workers' rights, but also of us having extra cities with cool names in the state of Michigan. Now, in exchange for the government's support of collective bargaining rights and inclusion of industrial unions into this uh, kind of wartime oversight 500 planes a day uh, system that's being implemented, the American labor movement agrees to something called a no strike pledge, right? It's kind of your scra you scratch my brat, I'll scratch yours. The federal government is taking over these auto manufacturing uh, plants in order to produce tanks, planes, guns, and everything else that the war effort might need. Uh, and not only are they doing that, but they're making sure that all of the workers who are employed in these places have the right to organize into unions, right? We're going to recognize the UAW. We're going to recognize the steel workers. Um, since we're doing this, if for the benefit of the war effort, the American labor movement could not strike, uh, it would be appreciated. This was a voluntary pledge by both the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, that craft uh, Labor Federation, as well as this new Congress of Industrial Organizations. They promised not to conduct strikes during the war, so wartime production would not be negatively affected. This actually echoed earlier, um, earlier plans that were implemented in World War I. If you recall from our uh, kind of emergence of the, uh, of the labor union movement, when we, talk about, when we talked about World War I, there was a similar system of price controls, where the government kind of set standards, they kind of monitored um, labor disputes and complaints against unfair practices by employers and, and corporations. Something very similar is being implemented here, but also if you recall from our lecture on World War I, after that war ended, there was very quickly a, uh, a retreat from government support of the labor movement. 
And while you had a lot of uh, cooperation between labor groups and the US government in 1916 and 1917, specifically the AFL takes a more respectable approach than the more militant IWW. Very quickly in 1918 and 1919, 1920, you see the government, you know, kind of brush labor aside. There's that first Red Scare. You have a lot of uh, IWW organizers and Wobblies being deported, being executed on flimsy evidence in, in kind of rushed trials. You have IWW organizers um, being lynched in Butte, Montana. You have AFL labor organizers being left in boxcars in the middle of the Nevada desert. Um, there's a general uh, recalcitrance and hostility towards labor after World War I. And ever good labor historians, labor organizers in the CIO uh, and other militant labor organizers on the left, look at, what look at what is happening during World War II and say, hey, call us crazy. Maybe after this war is over, we're going to see something similar. And so is a no-strike pledge really something that we should be taking on here, right? Hypothetical scenario, if we can anticipate the government turning against the labor movement after the war, is it in our interest to agree to a no-strike pledge if that's going to kind of zap the labor movement's strength? This is a question that's gonna come up and up again and again in uh, Lechenstein's uh, Labor's War at Home, CIO and World War II book, if you're interested in those questions. But to keep a very long story short, despite this, uh, despite protests from um, more left leaders, the no strike pledge is more or less um, the rule of law in the labor movement uh, throughout the remainder of World War II. There are a couple of examples, however. Um, John L. Lewis, who was president of the United Mine Workers, you might remember them from such battles as the Battle of Lair Mountain, the Ludlow Massacre, the Colorado Coalfield War. All of these names might uh, hearken up the fact that the UMWA might have not been uh, the most agreeable union. They were somewhat known for their militancy. John L. Lewis actually takes the UMWA out of the CIO in 1942 because of this no-strike pledge. And he leads the United Mine Workers on a series of strikes, both during and after World War II, that kind of sour the public image of the labor movement. The United Auto Workers has similar problems. You have wildcat strikes going on during World War II. Um, some of them are hate strikes. Some of them are more left-leaning strikes uh, that are launched into transgressions that are made by companies and auto parts producers that I suppose are now plain and tanks parts producers. You know, if the company says they're not going to fire anyone for union activity in exchange for a no-strike pledge, but they keep firing any, everyone, do you, you know, continue on with the no-strike pledge? Some people in the UAW said no. So there is significant uh, resistance to this no-strike pledge concept. But let's go ahead and talk about labor after the war. Um, I don't want to spoil anything for you since this is a history class, but also if you don't know, maybe it's worth saying. Uh, but the U.S. does win World War II. Um, they defeat the Nazis, at least until, uh, for a few decades, they defeated the Nazis. After World War II, this kind of international alliance between the Allies uh, starts to fall apart, though, and you have the onset of the Cold War. Uh, the Soviet Union, which from June 1941 to August of 1945 had been a more or less a staunch ally. There had been some disagreements on, on specific war plans, but there had been, they had been part of this grand alliance, this United Nations, as it would eventually be called. After the war, uh, the Soviet Union is pretty preoccupied with setting up uh, and making sure that countries on its border uh, in Europe are friendly nations. It has been uh, invaded twice from, uh, from Eastern Europe in the last 30 years by this point, and they don't want it to happen a third time. So, you know, uh, yes, Poland will be independent. We're not going to annex it, but uh, it has to be communist and it has to be friendly to our government. Otherwise, uh, we're going to get involved and make sure that uh, there is a government that we like there. This is a 
a trend that's sometimes referred to as a satellite state. You know, if you think about um, these larger uh, empires like the Soviet Union or the United States um, being like planets, then the things that are orbiting them are their satellites, right? The, the Bulgarian People's Republic or the People's Republic of Romania or the Hungarian People's Republic, all of these satellites kind of orbit the Soviet Union. In a similar capacity with the United States, uh, its satellites have uh, substantially more uh, agency and leeway and freedom to act uh, in their own interests than, uh, than their counterparts on the other side of the Iron Curtain. But South Korea, Japan, um, Western Europe are still very much dependent on, uh, on a defensive, um, on being covered by the United States' defensive umbrella. Similarly in East Asia, um, while well, China had been a member of this grand alliance of the United Nations in 1950, there is a revolution there, a change in management um, and China, at least mainland China, the majority of the country um, ends up going communist like the Soviet Union. So the world is starting to fracture between uh, nominally authoritarian communist countries or socialist countries and uh, at least uh, it is hoped democratic capitalist countries, though there are a number of capitalist countries uh, on the other side, our side of the Iron Curtain that are not democratic. Uh, Franco, Spain and the Estado Novo and Portugal are two just European examples that are, they're not democratic countries, but they are capitalist. Now, as we get closer to the end of the Cold War, there, the breakup of this alliance becomes increasingly apparent. Uh, to folks in government. And by 1944, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is running for his fourth term as president. It's unprecedented. There has never been a four-term president or even a three-term president before or after. Um, it had kind of been uh, the idea that you would only ever serve two terms as a president was, was the standard practice after George Washington refused to run for a third time. He was the first president. And if it was good enough for George, it's good enough for the rest of us. The exigencies of the Great Depression and World War II kind of break that practice though, and FDR is president for a little bit longer. Um, it's not until after World War II that the two-term presidency is codified into, into the Constitution. But in 1944, FDR is kind of ailing in health, and there is this recognition within the Democratic Party that his vice president will be taking over and who that vice president is is somewhat important because they will be kind of uh, inheriting this this post-war cold war system where the u.s is going to find itself in more direct competition with countries like russia and china in 1944 um, franklin delano roosevelt's vice president henry wallace is replaced with the more business friendly harry truman Henry Wallace would eventually run as a third uh, party candidate in 1948 as the short, uh, under the short-lived Progressive Party. But by 1948, the U.S. has kind of entered this second post-war Red Scare that's in a lot of ways similar to the first Red Scare, but in some other ways notably different. By 1948, the idea of a third party victory that, uh, under the Progressive Party is less likely than it might have been in 1944. So you have this shakeup in the Democratic Party. You have this emergence of, of Democrats who, while still friendly to the labor movement, still friendly to causes of workers' rights, are perhaps a little more pro-business and for the matters of the Cold War are uh, a little more anti-communist than some of these New Dealers who participated in this grand alliance with the Soviet Union, this popular front might have been. So you have a lot of organizations in the American labor movement, like Ruther's UAW, pushing for uh, the peacetime normalization of these government price controls that had, that had kind of come to dominate World War II, right? This idea of government and labor and industry kind of having a shared voice in economic production, this concept of industrial democracy that we had talked about. These unions start to, to advocate for these plans. People in the left of the Democratic Party view them as very real likelihoods. Uh, the UAW, the Progressive Party, and a lot of people on the left in the US at this time are making 
uh, vocal demands for social reforms that include uh, provisions for universal health care, um, rights to housing, rights to employment. FDR, prior to his passing in 1945, promised in the post-war era there would be a second Bill of Rights aimed specifically at the welfare of the working class. But after the shakeup and the emergence of the Cold War, all of these priorities are more or less placed on the backest furthest burner. If you want evidence of the of the factuality of that statement, the US still does not have a universal health care system or a public health care option for people who can't afford the private market. This is all just to not drive a point home too hard, but just to say that uh, it's important you vote political leaders and who's in office have an impact on the development of the country. Now, these reforms have a lot of popular support, but a lot of conservative politicians, either in the Republican Party or in the Democratic Party or in a third party that's probably not the progressives, uh, the Dixiecrats in 1948, um, have their own party that's uh, staunchly racist and pro-segregation, pro-states rights. But these conservative politicians look at these reforms and they think that they're going to pave the way for socialism coming to the United States. Right. It's entirely possible that um, that communist tyranny and socialist overreach will come to the United States, but it won't because Ru be because Russia invades, especially because now we have an atomic bomb. But you know, if uh, if workers are duped in the uh, in the polls, if they fall prey to these socialist promises in election season, maybe we'll vote in uh, communistic tyranny through democratic means. This fear wasn't outside the realm of reality for them. Of course, uh, a, cent or a decade earlier, Hitler had been elected democratically, right? Um, Czechoslovakia had an election where the communists were democratically given power and they quickly became a Soviet satellite state in 1948. And so they wanted to make sure that those reforms didn't happen, even if they were popular. And making sure those reforms didn't happen meant rolling back existing New Deal programs as well as uh, protections for the American labor movement that they felt were too powerful or too threatening to national security. A lot of times we look at the second Red Scare, right, this post-World War II period of, of return to, to normalcy, of uh, undoing all of these progressive uh, changes that had been kind of adopted out of necessity in the Great Depression and World War II. This Red Scare, a lot of people will associate with uh, Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy, who you see there smiling. Um, don't know what about, maybe it's that headline. A lot of people associate the Red Scare with McCarthy, like he just showed up one day and he read, uh, he made this famous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1950, that he has 149, 147 names of people in the State Department who are Communist Party members. Uh, by 1950, though, the Red Scare is already well underway. It's also worth pointing out that we never saw McCarthy's list. We don't know which names were on it. The number would also change. Sometimes it was 68 people in the State Department. Other times it was 419 people in the State Department who were members of the Communist Party. Personally, I don't think there was a list, but it, the, uh, the intended effect still occurred. And that is that Americans uh, started to become afraid of the labor movement and the chance of some of these needed reforms taking place began to dwindle. Now again, if we look back to, uh, to World War I and the and the post-war shakeup with the American labor movement that happened there, we're going to find some similarities here. I had a teacher in, uh, in high school, a history teacher, she taught me something that I thought was remarkably insightful, and that is that a lot of times people will tell you history repeats itself. It doesn't, because if it repeated itself, we'd be able to see uh, bad things coming a lot sooner than we do, and we'd be able to react to them. No, history echoes. Um, there are similarities, uh, but it's not a blanket repetition. And one of the things that's echoing here, 
is that as government has started to loosen its control of wartime industries, as it has at the end of World War I, after World War II, a lot of these industries come out and realize, hey, we're overpaying workers, and we're employing too many people, and we're not being efficient enough in our systems of production. And all of these observances very well may have actually been accurate. Um, the government policy during World War II to make sure that wartime production was going along well was to overemploy people so that the line never had to stop moving despite any sorts of personal or workplace issues that occurred at different plants. Ford's River Rouge factory system complex down in Dearborn at one point had 100,000 100, workers um, employed there. Because of cutbacks in automation today, that number might be closer to 5,000. But there were a lot of people. These companies were paying for a lot of workers, and some cutbacks did need to be made. Unions, of course, uh, did not want those cutbacks to happen. Just as from a company's perspective, they needed to kind of rein in spending uh, to accommodate for a peacetime economy. From the union's perspective, you know, just because you're retooling for peacetime production does not mean that you have to cut wages or lay off people unnecessarily if you can afford to keep people employed. The difference between that demand and supply side economics of what really generates economic activity is it uh, is it amount of dollars in circulation? Is it how much money a company has? Or is it how much uh, average people can buy the products you're producing? Two different perspectives and two different solutions to an issue. Regardless of these perspectives, though, as wages start to fall and people start to be laid off for this peacetime reconversion in the economy, unions react with strikes. Starting in 1945 and lasting until 1947, there was a massive post-war strike wave where both AFL and CIO unions sought to retain their wage increases and benefits that had been afforded to them during World War II. Even before the end of the war, you have over 10,000 film crew workers going on strike, 43,000 oil workers in October of 1945, and almost a quarter of a million auto workers uh, in November of that year. If you thought those three strikes would be it, you would be wrong. In 1946, other unions inspired by walkout sit-downs and post-war labor strikes, uh, they themselves take up uh, the challenge of confronting this, these uh, post-war austerity cutbacks. You have nearly 200,000 uh, electrical workers in January joined by almost 100,000 meat packers. Three quarters of a million steel workers also in January. By April of that year, they're joined by about a third of a million coal miners, no doubtedly represented by the United Mine Workers of America and John L. Lewis. A quarter of a million railroad engineers and trainmen nationwide in May. And then later on in December of 1946, you have yet more miners, rail workers, and steel workers, specifically in the Pittsburgh region, kind of the epicenter of US steel production, in December. There were a number of other strikes that included auxiliary uh, workers. General strikes broke out in parts of Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New York, and perhaps most famously in Oakland, California. The Oakland general strike, of course, is the subject of Loomis's uh, chapter in 10 strikes on the post-war labor order. Now, if you are a conservative politician in 1946, worried that the labor movement is going to overthrow the government and bring about socialist tyranny, the Great Strike Wave probably does not assuage your fears. You're not made uh, less, you're not less anxious in the start of 1947 after living through 1946 if you're a conservative politician or a businessman. In 1947, in response to the post-war labor unrest, the newly conservative House of Representatives, which had been voted in in 1946, they take on a majority in the House of Representatives and the Senate, they pass something known as the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947. It's better known as the Taft-Hartley Act, or if you're a particularly militant unionist, the Taft-Hartley Slave Labor Act. 
call it slave labor, not because the workers are literally enchained in the system of chattel slavery, but it's a, it's a reference to that wage slavery system that we talked about earlier on in the semester, right? The idea that, well, technically you're free to go, but if you don't work, you're not going to be able to afford food or, food or shelter. Taft-Hartley was incredibly controversial and was opposed by a lot of, a lot of Americans including this pro-business uh, Harry Truman, who had muscled out Henry Wallace as FDR's VP in 1944. Even Truman, who was an anti-communist, who took the United States into the Korean War to prevent the North Korean army from invading the South, he did not like the bill, and he tried to veto it. Conservatives, however, gained enough support because of uh, all of the wartime chaos, animosities, and fears about the labor movement potentially being tied to socialists. There were, of course, socialists in the labor movement, but whether or not they had control of the labor movement is debatable. Representatives in Congress during this period of the Red Scare overrode Truman's veto. And Taft-Hartley is actually uh, still it's still active, it's an active law, it still governs labor relations today. So what does Taft-Hartley do specifically, right? Why was it so controversial? Well, in order to rein in what conservative politicians saw as the labor movement's growing socialist New Deal liberalism power, Taft-Hartley Act specifically me, makes so that strikes could only be legal when they were approved by the union. It makes wildcat strikes illegal if there is a strike and the union has not signed off on it, or if the union is engaging in a strike outside of its regular contract bargaining period. Companies or the government can file an injunction against them. We, of course, know what an injunction is because the labor movement has been dealing with them for quite some time now, going all the way back to Pullman, right? Strikes could only be legal if they addressed work related issues. To us today, that might seem like an obvious, well, yeah, what else are you going to strike about? But back at the time, a lot of workers would engage in something called sympathy strikes. A company is discriminating against workers and my company does a lot of business with them. I am going to walk out and refuse work for working with my company in solidarity and sympathy with these other oppressed workers in the hopes that my company is going to stop doing business with that, with that aggrieving other company that's discriminating against workers. That is a sympathy strike, that is a solidarity strike. And the Taft-Hartley Labor Relations Bill of 1947 makes those illegal. It also makes union boycotts and mass picketing tactics illegal, right? If you call a boycott as an organization, you are interfering with interstate commerce. If you are a union and you have so many people on the picket lines that scab laborers or strike break laborers can't get in to work at a given area, you are preventing commerce. If you recall uh, the brief lecture that we had about the um, homestead strike, one of the tactics the workers were using before the strike collapsed was mass picketing, right? If there's so many people outside the Homestead steel mill, Carnegie can't get strike breakers into the actual plant. It's the next best thing to a sit down. And actually, as it were, mass picketing tactics include sit downs and those are not legal. That's why you don't see sit down strikes today or if you do, um, they're usually cleared out pretty quick by the police. The union shop or the closed shop was heavily restricted and phased out. The closed shop was this concept where a labor union and an employer would agree that they would only hire individuals who agreed to join the union. Essentially, it made sure that a unionization rate at a, at a shop was 100%. Every worker was a member. Taft-Hartley uh, started to do away with the system to create what is known as the open shop so that you didn't have to join the union if you didn't want to. It also permitted the passage of right to work laws, which start to spread uh, throughout the South specifically, but other areas of the country as well. 
Taft-Hartley required leaders of unions to sign non-communist affidavits, basically pledging that they were not socialists, communists, anarchists, or in any sort of organization that was trying to overthrow the government and install a leftist organization. If you were a Klansman or a neo-Nazi, that was probably all right, but you could not be a communist and in the labor movement. The list, of course, is a little bit longer than this, but these are the major points that you uh, should probably know. So what does Taft-Hartley do? What happens as a result of Taft-Hartley being passed, of it passing over a presidential veto, and then of the president, the executive branch, and later uh, legislative branches not being able to overturn Taft-Hartley, right? Taft-Hartley is still, uh, for better or worse, the, the governing legal framework that we enjoy today. Well, let's look at the South and civil rights. We did just mention, of course, that right to work laws started to pass first throughout the South. More recently, they made it to formerly union strongholds like Wisconsin and Michigan. If you remember how we talked about uh, industrial unionism's organizing approach, they tend to avoid notions of the labor aristocracy, right? You get better returns if everyone is in the labor movement than if you really just focus on a couple of identity markers that a worker might have, right? Some of these could be craft skill or they could be race-based or they could be a worker's sex. We're not going to, to really divide along these lines, at least in theory, right? Practice is always different in theory. But industrial uh, unions then would probably be uh, supportive of racial equality and civil rights. If you're supportive of racial equality and civil rights, that means that it is much harder, and it, uh, you know, if your members are too, of course, that makes it much harder for a company to divide workers along lines of race and break up uh, collective action. It's hard for you as an employer to convince your white employee to return to work even while their black coworker is out on strike um, if the white employee and the, and the black employee hate each other. If they like each other, they're not going to do that and it's going to be harder to break that strike. This being said, calls for civil rights and racial justice were treated as incredibly suspect by the FBI and other intelligence systems that the US government had either enlarged or created during World War II. During the Great Depression, for example, uh, the Communist Party of the United States was a vocal supporter of the civil rights movement before uh, the post-war civil rights movement of the 1950s started to take real shape. One of the platforms of the Communist Party was active, uh, active self-determination for um, America, what was known as the Black Belt. Right. Communists in the 1920s and 1930s looked at the situation in the United States. This is, of course, before uh, the most of the Great Migration, where African-American workers started to move to the industrial Northeast. The majority of African-Americans lived in the South. They made up the majority of demographic communities there. And communists said, hey, maybe they should be able to determine whether or not they're going to remain in the United States. They have self-determination, right? They are a nation within a nation, and they should have uh, their own right to self-government. Of course, if you have a political movement within a country calling for a portion of that country to have rights to independence, that can be seen as undermining national security somewhat. So while not everyone, obviously, who called for civil rights and racial justice were at the same time calling for uh, black nationalist secession, um, the FBI, at least at this time, had the tendency to, uh, pardon the pun, only look at things in black and white, right? Either you are supportive of the United States or you're, uh, you're one of the evildoers. You support our fight against communists or you're probably a communist yourself. And so there was a lot of suspicion um, of the early civil rights movement by law enforcement. And that meant, similarly, that there was a lot of suspicion of the labor movement. Allowing individual states to pass right to work laws limited the effectiveness of the American labor movement's efforts to organize workers in the South, where workers were more formally divided along lines of race. 
This could either be by de jure or de facto segregation. De jure and de facto are basically just two Latin phrases, um, meaning either in practice or officially. Right, de jure is like of the of the judicial system, like this is a law, and de facto is just like, hey, it's just a fact. Segregation can take a number of different forms. America today has prided itself on get, getting rid of segregation, but it has only really in some situations gotten rid of de jure segregation, right? It's illegal to have whites only drinking fountains, but that doesn't mean de facto segregation doesn't exist, right? Sundown towns did not suddenly stop existing because of the Civil Rights Act. They persist to today. Disparities in housing and healthcare and education and any other uh, major system in the country still experiences de facto uh, racial disparities and segregation, even if it's not codified into law. After World War II, we talked a little bit about the second clan of the 1920s. After World War II, the third clan opposing the, the civil rights movement and integration in the 1950s um, civil rights campaigns would start to go, grow into prominence. Both the second and third clans were incredibly anti-labor and that was because of the industrial unionization practice of treating, um, at least in theory, uh, white workers and workers of colors uh, with the same amount of respect. Again, whether or not an industrial union would treat white and black workers the same, they probably didn't, but the ideology of racial equality was very off-putting to people who did not believe in racial equality. So this brings us probably to talk, uh, talk about Operation Dixie. It's the biggest political campaign you've probably never heard of. After World War II, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, as well as the American Federation of Labor, they had a very similar campaign, but it wasn't as well financed or run. The Congress of Industrial Organization put out a lot of money to send uh, union organizers uh, and union staffers to 12 Southern states throughout, uh, well, throughout the South, the end of World War II, basically to shore up the gains of the labor movement that had been made over the last decade. You have a lot of steel workers organizing in places like uh, Pennsylvania. You have a lot of miners organized in West Virginia. You have a lot of auto workers organized in Michigan. Other industries elsewhere, different organizations. The International Ladies Garment Workers Union in places like New York City is an example, or you have the International Longshoremen's Union in California or also on the Eastern Seaboard. In the South though, unionization rates is below the national average. And the CIO looks at this and says, if we can organize workers in the South to the same degree as, has, as we have done in the North, then we will make union membership, we can make uh, the idea of industrial democracy the federal norm. This of course runs up against entrenched racism and Jim Crow segregation, right? That du jour segregation, that codified segregation into law. Now entrenched racism and segregation are already strong opponents to the labor movement. And the federations like the CIO and AFL very much anticipated a hard fight in, uh, in the South over Operation Dixie. But when they launched Operation Dixie, what they were not relying on is the Taft-Hartley Act. The Taft-Hartley Act only further undercuts Operation Dixie's chances for success. Initially launched a year earlier in May of 1946, major uh, industrial unions contribute about a million dollars in seed money and fielded over 200 labor organizers throughout the Deep South to, to drive up labor organizing. A one million dollars might not seem like a lot, but this is in 1946 money. Nowadays, a million dollars in 1946 is more, uh, is a little over $13 million. If that still doesn't seem like a lot, in 2016, which was uh, obviously an election year, the American Federation of Labor and Congress and Industrial Organizations, the big labor group today, um, 
shelled out $12 million the entire year for all of its uh, left progressive causes, right? That includes all the money that was given to the Hillary Clinton campaign. It includes all of the money that went into uh, Justice for Janitors, uh, the organized Walmart campaigns, calls for universal health care. More money was spent in Operation Dixie in 1946 than was spent by the labor movement on political lobbying in its entirely in its entirety 60 years later. So Operation Dixie was a huge operation. As the second Red Scare of the 1950s drew on though, this general hostility uh, to politicians on the left, to labor unions, industrial unions particularly, um, was further eroded and support for the labor movement in the South specifically began to wane. By 1949, Operation Dixie had only made a few inroads and it was largely abandoned as anti-union attacks put, ended up putting many unions on the defensive. So Operation Dixie is not a success. Taft-Hartley is able to uh, allow these Southern states to force, uh, forestall racial integration and labor organizing uh, by using right to work tactics, by making it harder for unions to organize. And you know, good old fashioned Jim Crow racism certainly had a hand in that. So Taft-Hartley was not good for civil rights. I think it, may, it might be fair to say. Of course, there's always a, uh, there's room open to debate and interpretation if you see it a different way. I'd love to hear that in class discussion. But for now, I'll leave that point there. Well, how about sex and gender equality? Taft-Hartley obviously could not have affected sex and gender equality, right? Well, another aspect of the labor movement that made many post-war Americans wary was its developing attitudes towards women's labor and women's rights. Specifically, a lot of conservative politicians in the, in the post-war era called for a return to traditional values that treated the, the normative heterosexual family as the central building block of society, right? The American family is kind of the cornerstone of everything else in our society. And in keeping with that, uh, that motif that runs throughout our history, you know, women should obviously stay in the home, the domestic sphere, as we've talked about earlier, well, men should primarily be the breadwinners, right? It's the man's job to go out and have a job. And it's kind of the, the mom's, the woman's job to raise children and to do all of the reproductive labor at home, right? We have terms for this. You could call it coverture. You could call it Republican motherhood, the culture of domesticity. Sometimes uh, that second part of culture is dropped off and people refer to it as the cult of domesticity. I personally am a fan of that one. Now this runs up against gains that, women's, that women had made during wartime in areas of employment, right? Personal agency and citizenship rights. For a lot of women, rights to have a job, to have finances separate from their husband, to live on their own, these were all won either through union efforts and campaigns or simply by relation of the fact that they had in defense work a high enough paying regular union job on which they could be economically self-sufficient. The labor movement's tacit support of feminist principles as a wider part of industrial organizing really only served to er uh, earn it further opponents going into the post-war Red Scare. So following the war, a lot of women who had taken employment in these wartime defense plants started to see a lot of disproportionate layoffs and furloughs, right? You have a lot of factories at this point starting to, to be retooled. Uh, we don't need to make 200 Sherman tanks at the Chrysler stamping plant today because the war is over. So uh, we're actually going to swap out all of this machinery and we're gonna go back to making Buicks. I don't, not Buicks, uh, Dodge Rams. Well, as it turns out, while you're retooling an entire factory, you don't need all of the factory workers there because the machines aren't set up to make Dodge Rams. So you had a lot of women workers who had been working in these defense plants for years now, who had built lives based around this income and had gained years of seniority on the job, had become expert manufacturers in their own right, and union members, stewards, stewardesses, and I think steward is still the general 
term, stewards people. Once this retooling process was completed and women were expected to return to work, they actually found out that they weren't getting calls back. Instead, those calls were going primarily to men. Preferences for male workers were couched in terms of both family values and of just post-war patriotism. Many of the rehired male workers who were replacing women had served as GIs, general infantrymen, or in some other capacity during World War II, and, you know, at least it was argued, were responsible for earning a family wage that could adequately support a four to five person household comfortably. And that would, of course, include a wife and 2.5 children, or perhaps, um, perhaps a, one individual from the older generation, maybe a, an individual's uh, parent wasn't economically uh, self-reliant, and so they would, they would stay with their married children. So despite the fact that for several years at this point, oftentimes for much longer, women had continued to live independent lives separate from, separate from husbands or men, um, even if they themselves had to take care of their children, mind you, they were suddenly faced uh, with discrimination in employment when men were coming back from the war, right? George here, uh, only worked in the auto body department for two years before he went off to, to fight in, um, in the Pacific. And Dolores took his place and has worked here for five years. However, uh, because George fought in the war, um, we are going to prioritize him, right? Those five years he was off on campaign, we're just going to count as him working for us. So he actually has seven years of, of uh, seniority. Sorry, Dolores, you're just not going to stay on the job. Some historians look back on this and they understand the, the preferential treatment for male employees as a modern, again, de facto extension of this system of coverture, right? In lived reality, um, women just as men could be responsible for their family's collective income, but there is this prevailing ideology that women are subservient to men or that men are kind of stewards over women in their lives. They're not full citizens. And so it's, uh, it is more commiserate for a man to have a job than a woman. Now these types of inequalities we look at today and we can sometimes believe that they were maybe not solved, but they began to become addressed in the 1960s and 1970s as part of the second wave of feminism. If you don't know what a wave, uh, what feminist wave theory is, it basically is a terminology that historians will use to divide up uh, women's rights uh, initiatives and struggles throughout history into kind of these specific concrete periods, right? The first wave, of course, was the suffragist movement, um, fighting for women's political rights, uh, begins in the late 1800s and lasts until 1920 when women receive, white women receive the right to vote. And then as kind of orthodoxy goes, the women's movement more or less dies out. You have the Great Depression, and women obviously weren't fighting for women's rights during the Great Depression. The Great Depression, it was all the economy. But in 1965, women kind of uh, come out of the woodwork again, and they start to demand uh, social and economic equality in addition to their political rights, right? And this is known as the second wave. Um, more recently, there's been a third wave uh, that kind of emerged at the end of the 1980s and in, through the 1990s that saw the deconstruction of social categories of gender and sexuality, right? The idea that, um, that you can be a different gender while at the same time being physically male. The idea of gender as being this, uh, this performance that people undertake on a day-to-day, -day, right? Just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you are naturally attracted to the color pink. That's more of a social construct. More recently, there's been talk about a fourth wave or a a globalization of women's rights discussions. Whether or not it is a fourth wave, or even if you believe that waves are a good way of describing uh, the history of the feminist movement are all things that, can, that are up for debate. But what's missing in these waves, right? Did, in 1920, do women really just vanish and go away and don't come back for a half century? Of course not. 
some feminist historians object to categorizing women's activism into these periods of, of wave activism, because doing so kind of only treats their struggles as central and others that are related to, to feminist activism can be marginalized. Feminist activism that kind of overlaps with other forms of activism can be overlooked. Does feminism exist in World War II? It actually does. In between this first and this second wave, you actually have uh, in the labor movement the existence of a wide ranging battleground um, throughout the 1930s and 40s and 50s where women actively contested uh, these socially imposed gender roles, right? These traditions that argued that women had to be uh, domestic caretakers and like these sources of, um, of homespun cottage happiness. Then a man would come home and there'd be a chicken in the pot and a pipe ready to go for him, a, a tobacco pipe, of course. And that he would read the newspaper in his galoshes while, uh, while his wife served him dinner. Very stereotypical, leave it to beaver-esque type of mindset. As it turns out, women didn't just accede to that willingly. Women defense workers um, actively argued that reproductive labor should be shared by husband and wife as, a, as an equal partnership. And that women in financial affairs, in, in political decisions and social decisions, and on the workplace and unions should have just as much of an equal voice as men. In Detroit, in the UAW, for example, uh, Emily Hawes became a defense worker in, uh, at the start of the war in 1941, 1942, early 1942, I believe. She, she signs up to do defense work. She ends up building planes. And in her experiences in the labor movement, she writes a couple of books titled, uh, two of them are titled Why Women Cry and Hurry Up, Please, It's Time. And in books like these, women defense workers and feminist activists cha uh, challenged what was uh, what Hawes describes as, quote, the Hitlerian routine of children kitchen church. Many American women were kind of uh, told through, through cultural reinforcement, through social pressure, through peer pressure, through education, were told that really the only career option available to them was to be housewives. Uh, a career it would be possible um, as a, you know, perhaps maybe as a teacher or a garment worker, uh, but only if they didn't want to have children and they wanted to live as spinsters, right? Reproductive labor was the responsibility of women. Women needed to, to primarily care for the children. And women defense workers looked at the situation. They said, actually, no, that sounds like, uh, like you're denying me of my rights as a citizen as a, in a, and, uh, of a human, as a human being. So I'm not going to really just be okay with this. Now, these writings didn't lead to some sort of feminist revolution, as a lot of people who uh, authored and read them had hoped. But they did inspire uh, later thinkers who would substantially alter sex and gender relations in the United States. Betty Friedan uh, read Hawes's work and critiqued that she uh, hoped that it would, quote, come, uh, that it would, uh, quote, inspire a revolution that would come from the nation's kitchens. Now, if you don't know who Betty Friedan is, she, in, in the mid-1960s, wrote her own book known as, titled The Feminine Mystique. And the feminine mystique is uh, oftentimes credited with kits starting, starting the second wave of the feminist movement. But the feminine mystique, even if you do believe in wave theory, didn't come out of nowhere and was, in fact, uh, based on earlier sources of inspiration. These earlier sources of inspiration, uh, women's historians and labor historians will sometimes refer to as the lost wave of the feminist movement or uh, specifically they'll refer to this 1930s, 1940s period of feminist activism as labor feminism. This actually brings us to our third book recommendation. If you're interested in this lost uh, wave of feminism, the labor feminist movement, I would strongly recommend Nancy Gabum's Feminism in the Labor Movement, Women and the United Auto Workers from 1935 to 1975. Uh, it's a little older than some of these other um, recommendations that I alluded to earlier on in the lecture, 
but it's also one of these uh, sources of historical scholarship that just really uh, stands up to time um, and stands uh, on its own merits and has not needed substantial uh, qualifications to keep it um, up to date as a source of historical scholarship. It's a pretty authoritative work, at least on women in the United Auto Workers uh, for this 40 year period. But it also has wider implications, of course, for women and feminist experiences in the labor movement as a whole. So, okay. By undermining the power of the labor movement, Taft Hartley is able uh, to reduce the labor movement's effectiveness against this Red Scare pushback against, uh, against gender equality. Right? A lot of women workers who had um, initially joined the labor movement and after uh, the war had started to contest the idea that they would be so easily replaced with men on the shop floor, um, when the Red Scare kind of comes into its full fruition, they're very quickly denounced as communists, right? You know who else believes in gender equality? Stalin. Okay, so Taft-Hartley is not good for, for sex and gender equality. What about the freedom of sexuality? What about, um, what about gays and lesbians, transgender people? Believe it or not, gays and lesbians, bisexual people, transgender people, they all existed before the Stonewall Uprising in 1969. They simply were not as visible. The labor movement during World War II was actually the site of some of the earliest forms of identity articulation for LGBTQ people in the United States. And while sexual and gender transgression, right, this idea of transgressing socially defined boundaries of what was right for a man and a woman, right? These boundaries, of course, are if you're a man, you have to behave like a man and you can only have relationships with women. These boundaries for women were pretty much the inverse. You have to look like a woman and you can only have a relationship with a man, right? Transgressing against these boundaries, of course, uh, means that you're uh, your, perform your gender performance is different or that you have a, a same-sex attraction. So these, sites of these kinds of transgressions can be found throughout world history. But basing your political beliefs, your personal identity, or, uh, or assigning that part of yourself uh, substantial value in your own internal uh, your own internal discussion of who you are as a person, that's actually fairly recent. And it comes from this period where a lot of people who may have had these internal uh, desires to transgress against these uh, social sexual boundaries, they start to be able to have the resources to do that, right? So many women workers, for example, by joining, uh, by becoming employed in these defense industries, are able to leave smaller communities that are more closely knit with their family circles. There's a lot more um, community oversight over their relationships with other people, who they're talking to, who they're cavorting around with, so to speak. These women are able to leave these small communities and go to large urban areas where they're afforded some sense of anonymity, right? You can be who you want. Your neighbor isn't going to call home and tell your mom what you're doing because your neighbor doesn't know you. Not only that, but you're now being paid, you know, relatively decent for, for putting these planes together to bomb the Nazis. And so you have some disposable income. You can't buy nylon stockings because those are requisition for the war effort, but maybe nylon stockings weren't your thing to begin with. Women experiencing this newfound independence and freedom are able to more freely explore their romantic interests and pursue them that you know, in normal circumstances, normative circumstances might have been closed off to them. Maybe after your shift at uh, the Dodge main plant, assembling um, wires in the wire room for these bombers, maybe after your shift you would go to a bar and maybe when you went to that bar you would see another woman defense worker who you were attracted to, who you wanted to talk to. And because you are now detached from these more socially conservative communities that kind of police who and how you interact with people, you can have that conversation now. 
homosexual men experience similar revelations. Now, for a lot of women, um, the site of lesbian identity, uh, the creation of lesbian identity, articulation of lesbian identity happened on or, or around these sites of, of defense um, employments, right? So maybe you didn't talk to this woman you were interested in as a woman defense worker on the job, but you would go to a, a bar that specifically catered toward uh, certain women defense workers in the area afterwards, and you might get a drink. It's called a homosocial working environment, homo meaning the same and social meaning, well, social. Homosexual men experience similar, um, similar circumstances simply by joining the military. You're fighting in the military, um, you're interested in other men, and as it turns out, when you have a lot of men together and they are on one boat going to one island and they're on this boat for a long time, you're going to be able to talk to other men. And it is entirely possible that throughout this process, you're, you are going to meet other men who also like men, and you can kind of bond and talk and discuss that, those feelings that you have. Whereas before, again, if you were in one of these small non-urban communities, there's going to be a lot of social oversight to monitor who you talk to and how. Prominent LGBTQ historians actually refer to World War II because of this trend as a nationwide coming out mo uh, moment. So even though uh, gays and lesbians aren't burning cop cars in New York City and Stonewall in 1969 at this time, that doesn't necessarily mean that gays and lesbians and bisexual and transgender people aren't starting to come out themselves. That's all well and good, you might say, but what does this have to do with the labor movement? Well, as it turns out, this idea of working class solidarity and trying to get workers to cooperate together regardless of their racial background or their sex could just as well actually extend to uh, sexuality, right? One union, the uh, Marine Cooks and Stewards Union is a very good example. They followed a very strict solidaristic policy, policy that was expressed as no race baiting, no red baiting, and no queen baiting to refer to the union's official policy against uh, dividing membership along lines of identity, right? No race baiting basically means, hey, uh, respect your union brothers and sisters. If they're black or white, they're still in the same union and we're doing the same job and you should treat each other with respect regardless. No red baiting was actually in reference to, uh, to political ideology, right? We're all workers here. We're all in the same union. You might disagree that William believes in communism, but that's William's right is an American, right? He has a First Amendment right to believe in the things that he believes. And so it's not in, uh, it's not in your interests as a part of this union to try and get him fired, get him thrown out of the union, even if you don't like that side of his politics. Queen baiting followed a very similar strand. It's a term that we don't really uh, hear a lot of today, but you will sometimes hear no race baiting and no red baiting. Queen baiting uh, referred to dividing working class solidarity along heterosexist lines or homophobic lines, right? Just because you don't like the fact that Tim over there is into, is into other men doesn't mean that he's less of a worker and it doesn't mean that he deserves less respect than you do. Now, terms like homophobia and homosexual weren't actually widespread at the time, and there were a number of different terms that were used to refer to queer people or gender and sexual minorities um, at the time. And so queen baiting is just one term to refer to resisting uh, what we today would understand as homophobia, right? That discrimination against people who are different from you because of their sexual orientation, or in some circumstances, gender identity. So union activists like Hawes and members of the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union and others who challenged traditional gender and sexuality norms were seen by conservatives in the post-war era as threatening the established order and security of the United States. Right, labor feminists were decried as communists, as we have said before, right? Stalin believes in gender equality. You're trying to, you're trying to drive men out of good family 
uh, wage jobs because of your, your crazy socialist ideas of gender equality. And it's undermining the traditional values of the United States. Clearly, you're a communist. Elizabeth Hawes, the fashion designer turned defense worker in 1942, who I told you about, in 1953 was brought up in front of the Senate. She was decried as a communist. Um, she was threatened with prison terms if she didn't name names. She does not actually name names, and she ends up retiring and living the rest of her life in obscurity. She dies in the 1960s of old age. Similarly, LGBTQ workers faced reprisals, including imprisonment, right? It wasn't until 1974 that the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality or same-sex attraction off of its list of psychological disorders. And so up until 1974, if there was credible evidence that you were a homosexual, it was very you know, entirely possible that you would be committed to an institution and lobotomized in order to make you right for society. If you don't know what a lobotomy is, it is a procedure uh, that is very horrendous, and I would refer to you to our Psych 101 course. Even if you weren't institutionalized and lobotomized, you still might only be imprisoned, right, in a non-psychiatric institution, or you may just uh, get out lucky and uh, escape with being fired and disowned by your family. Now, a much deeper and more widespread suppression of feminists and LGBTQ workers and activists occurred at the same time as the Second Red Scare, and it's known as the Lavender Scare. A lot of times, uh, historians will talk about the Second Red Scare, they'll talk about McCarthyism specifically, and they'll cite the hundreds of workers who lost their jobs, who a lot of film workers uh, and actors in Hollywood, radio personalities like Orson Welles, people who were blacklisted because of their supposed political beliefs, hundreds of them. Lives ruined, incomes lost, families torn apart. The Lavender Scare had the same effect on thousands to upwards of tens of thousands of feminists, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender people, and queer people. So what did Taft-Hartley's effects have on sex and gender equality? Well, as part of the wider Second Red Scare, it suppressed campaigns for women's equality for decades, and it drove many homosexuals into the closet where they would remain, sometimes until the 70s, other times they would never come out at all. So Taft-Hartley was probably, you know, again, we can perhaps suggest, though there is still open, uh, there's room for open debate, we can suggest that Taft-Hartley might not have been great for civil rights. We can also suggest that Taft-Hartley probably wasn't great for gender equality or the rights of LGBTQ people. How about general freedom of speech and association? Well, in addition to the general pressures that were put on labor unions after World War II, Taft-Hartley compelled union leaders to sign these anti-communist affidavits, right? I'd swear as the president of the International uh, Fruit Canning uh, Workers Union, Local 178, that I am not a communist or a socialist or a member of any of those organizations. This was a requirement by Taft-Hartley. If a union didn't do this, if they failed to do this, they would be decertified by the National Labor Relations Board. Of course, recall the National Labor Relations Board was made uh, about 10 years earlier by the National Labor Relations Act, and it's really the only thing uh, in the country that gives labor movements the, uh, the legal and effective uh, ability to bargain on behalf of workers, right? You had a uh, similar labor programs under the earlier NIRA. You had similar labor programs during the First World War. But labor organizing, at least in, on industrial terms, was never too terribly successful unless you were in uh, some of these more uh, compact and, and bound and very dangerous, uh, dangerous kinds of professions like mining. Their industrial labor might, might have some success. But for the industrial labor movement, right, industrial unions, the NLRB, 
basically enshrines a certain degree of rights for workers so that they can join these industrial unions. And if a union is decertified by the National Labor Relations Board, how long can it last? That union can't appeal to the NLRB if there are wrongful terminations. That union can't appeal to the NLRB if there are uh, actions being taken by a company to decertify a union or to drive workers out of a union or to set up a dual union in competition with it. So many CIO unions, in order to maintain bargaining rights for their members, agreed to sign these affidavits. And any members who refused would simply be expelled. The UAW says we're going to sign these non-communist affidavits. Bill, you have to sign this paper. Um, well, I don't want to. Why, Bill? Are you a communist? No, no, I just, I don't agree with the principle. I think I should have the right to believe what I want to believe, First Amendment rights and all of these sorts of things, freedom of association. I should be able to join any party I want and still be a member of the union. UAW turns around and says, all right, Bill, well, you know, thank you for your candor, and in theory, we agree with you, but at the end of the day, the, we need to get paid. Daily bread is daily bread, so you're expelled. If we don't expel you, we'll get decertified by the NLRB. Goodbye. Now, this could be a contentious position to take, right? Unions that don't sign these affidavits might face reprisal. But at the same time, when you compel your members to sign these affidavits, aren't you infringing on their freedom of speech, on their freedom of association? Some of these unions that refuse to sign affidavits ultimately do face decertification. The Marine Cooks and Stewards Union, that progressive no red, no race, and no queen baiting union that we discussed uh, just a short time ago, is one example. As it turns out, that no red baiting policy of worker solidarity doesn't really line up with anti-communist affidavits that well. And after the Marine Cooks and Stewards refuse to, to sign these affidavits, they're expelled from the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The CIO says, all right, well, you're out. A new, more conservative union is set up. A lot of uh, the workers in the MCS in order to keep their jobs, to keep their wages, end up leaving the MCS for this new dual union. And by 1954, the same year as the Army McCarthy hearings, right, these hearings where President McCarthy accuses then President Ike Eisenhower of harboring communists in the Defense Department, you really have to go, you really have to try to think that Ike Eisenhower, who almost bombed North Korea with nuclear weapons, was a communist, but you know, McCarthy found a way. The same year as the Army McCarthy hearings, the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union was all but defunct. So there's something to be said for signing these affidavits, right? If, if it's between uh, your union's life or death, maybe signing the affidavits is, uh, is a no brainer. That being said, two other major unions refused to sign affidavits and they did quite well. United Mine Workers is one such example. They already left the CIO back in 1942. John L. Lewis and his very big eyebrows uh, told Walter Ruther and a lot of the more moderate members of these industrial unions, you know what, we don't need you. We're just going to, we're going to continue doing our thing. The mine workers were around before the CIO and the mine workers will be around after the CIO. The UMWA, of course, is still around today. Uh, they did not rejoin the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations again until the, the late 1980s. So for about the better part of five decades, the United Mine Workers of, of America refuses to sign these affidavits and they continue on. Another example is the United Electric, Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America, or UE. The UE was a fairly large union. It had uh, successfully unionized workers at General Electric. By the end of the war, however, uh, when they are also pressured to sign anti-communist affidavits, they refuse. The CIO sets up a dual union known as the International Union of Electrical Radio and Machine Workers, or IUE. They start to directly compete for members, but despite this, the UE is still around today. It has far fewer members than it did in 1946, mind you. 
but it survived. So what can we take away from all this? Anti-communist pressure, the failure of Operation Dixie, and the restriction of union power after the Tartley Act, Taft-Hartley Act all combined to eventually turn the tide in the union movement and these campaigns for workers' rights. Not long after the passage of Taft-Hartley, as the labor movement started to kind of run out of steam, so to speak, you start to see precipitous drops in union membership. Whether or not Taft-Hartley, uh, no one would suggest that Taft-Hartley is the sole reason for the decline of the labor movement following World War II. But by the 1960s, you start to see real problems in the labor movement. And some of this stems from labor's ability to respond to business and government, which after uh, World War II, especially with the onset of the Red Scare, they start to cooperate a lot more than they had during the New Deal era of the 1930s. In order to retain as much bargaining power as possible, the AFL and CIO merge in 1955. American Federation of Labor with its more antiquated craft model of organizing and the Congress of Industrial Organizations with its more industrial approach agree to let bygones be bygones and to focus more specifically on organizing just to organize, right? Maybe the means aren't so important. Maybe we should really just focus on growing the labor movement as much as possible and we shouldn't compete with each other as much as we have. There's definitely something to be said for that. In 1955, the newly created AFL-CIO would become and stand as the sole major labor federation in the United States for the rest of the 20th century. There are some, uh, there are some specific problems with saying it's the only labor federation um, in the 1960s. There is a newly created Alliance for Labor Action, and we will talk about that in our next lecture. And then more recently, there has been a competing uh, labor federation called Change to Win. And we'll talk about that group uh, as we get closer to the end of the end of the semester. Well, this post-war unification of the two federations made for a uniquely powerful labor organization, one that probably helps the labor movement retain a lot of the political power that it could have lost had there not been cooperation between these two organizations. It also means that a lot of the problems that are inherent in the original AFL that the CIO left because they wanted to, you know, correct or not, you know, basically not repeat those same mistakes. Those problems aren't really ever rectified to the extent that a lot of unionists who left the AFL believed uh, needed to be done. We will talk about those, uh, those specific problems in our next semester when we talk about rebellion within the labor movement in a time period that is sometimes known as the long 1970s. But let's recap for today. 500 planes a day was a plan devised by the United Auto Workers for the cooperation of labor movement, of labor unions, government, and manufacturing corporations that enabled greater wartime production and the production of supplies that were needed by the Allies. Hate strikes uh, were a response to this, uh, partially at least, this 500 days uh, planes a day plan. A hate strike was a wildcat strike explicitly launched in defense of discriminatory or exclusionary policies, usually pertaining to race or sex. Uh, specifically, hate strikes opposed shop floor integration. If we're going to build 500 planes a day, we need a bunch of workers, and that includes white and black workers, and why can't they work alongside one another? Well, hate strikers had some reasons. The no strike pledge was a controversial promise by the labor movement to not strike during World War II. Viewed by many as a patriotic sacrifice, but the pledge drew ires from some of the labor movement's more militant and active organizers, because they argued that companies weren't holding up their end of the bargain, and if they weren't, why should labor? Operation Dixie was the massive post-war effort by the American labor movement, specifically the CIO, but also to a lesser extent the AFL, to extend unionization to the American South, where labor's power was notably diminished. 
Despite considerable resources and commitment, Operation Dixie largely failed because of Jim Crow segregation, Red Scare fear tactics, and the passage of the Taft-Hartley Slave Labor Bill in 1947. The long form name of that is the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947. And if you forgot what that was, it was a law enacted in 1947 after the post-war strike wave that amended workers' rights protected under the Wagner Act and substantially reduced the power of the American labor movement. Taft-Hartley remains in force to this day. That is going to go ahead and conclude our lecture for today. For our next class, right, this, uh, November 9th. Make sure you finish Stephen Meyer's Manhood on the Line. That's chapter six, seven, and the conclusion. And then you'll want to read uh, Loomis's Ten Strikes, chapter seven. That's the, that's the chapter on the Oakland general strike and the onset of the Cold War. And you'll also want to read chapter four of Fowes Rethinking the American Labor Movement. That's uh, a more general look at the stability and retreat of the labor movement. 1945, the end of World War II, until 1960. Until November 9th, of course, if you have any questions, if you need any help, I am available in my office hours, and I'm also available via email. Just send me a message, either over email or through Canvas chat, and I will make sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in class.